Welcome. It's indisputable. I'm your host, Rashad Richard. Good to be with you. We have a lot on the agenda today. Breaking down news of the day, none other than Michael Short, reporter, TYT contributor, good fella all around. Should be a fascinating breakdown. Top story of the day. Donald Trump's attorney general says, yeah, Trump is likely going to be indicted again. I got some background and some foreground. Here it is. My, my read was that uh, they were going to indict him, and I still think there's a very good chance of that. Uh, because, And I think it depends on how sensitive the documents were, but also uh, what evidence they have of uh, obstruction and games playing by the president and, the, and whether he directed people to lie or gave them information that was uh, deceitful to pass on to the government. Now, you and, know, and the president, unfortunately, has a penchant for... Uh, engaging in reckless and, and self-destructive behavior that brings these kinds of things on him. In many respects, he's his, only, he's his own worst enemy. I don't think that's the case uh, with Bragg's uh, case, but certainly he, he's dug himself a hole on the documents and also on the January 6th stuff. That was reckless behavior that was destined to end up uh, being investigated. So it doesn't surprise me. Uh, that he has all these legal problems. He was warned about this before he left office. Bill co-conspirator Barr. You see, Bill Barr, while being attorney general, actually protected, allowed Donald Trump to commit criminal acts, did an investigation. That investigation led to absolutely nowhere because he decided that he would spearhead the investigation into absolutely Nothing. So while he goes on television talking big and bad about his, I guess, newfound freedom, or maybe backbone, let's make sure the record is very clear. Donald Trump used his attorney general to shield him from absolute prosecution. That was Bill Barr's real job, to make sure Donald Trump did not get prosecuted. But let me go down the list here, because it was interesting that Barr says, well, it depends on how sensitive the documents are. Well, guess what? We already know how sensitive some of the documents were that Trump stole. They were special access programs. You know what a special access program is? Well, it is different than just a regular classified document or operation. Special access programs are basically in a silo. They are so confidential, so classified, and so guarded that they basically exist outside of the normative chain of command and the normative chain of intelligence review. These are really, really top secret documents. Donald Trump was in possession of documents classified as special access programs. These programs are so classified that even the head of the CIA has to go through a bureaucratic process in order to get access to those same documents. Those are the documents Trump had according to the report. Now, let's go down the list. Trump, as I said before, will be a defendant for the rest of his life. Manhattan indictment, that's just to kick things off. What else we have? We have the Georgia election tampering probe. I do believe that is going to be his second indictment from Fulton County, Georgia. I think that indictment is already underway. The special purpose grand jury, I believe they have already recommended an indictment. A normal or normative grand jury will need to be impaneled in order for that indictment to stick. I think that process is happening now. U.S. Capitol attack. That investigation continues. The U.S. Justice Department has investigations underway in both Trump's actions for the 2020 election and his retention of highly classified information was going to get him in that case. It's the back and forth with the government when the government attempted to actually get these documents back. Missing government records. U.S. Attorney Merrick Garland also appointed Jack Smith to investigate whether Trump improperly retained classified records at his Mar-a-Lago, Mar Florida estate after he left the office in 2021. As I've said before, Jack Smith is not the guy you bring in to investigate. He's the guy you bring in to execute prosecution. It continues. New York Attorney General civil lawsuit. So we have the AG of New York 
Letitia James sued Trump and his Trump organization last September for fraud. You have a slew of defamation lawsuits. So here's my prediction. So first you have the Manhattan indictment. I think the second indictment will actually come from the state of Georgia by way of Fulton County. I believe the third indictment comes as Bill Barr somewhat predicted by way of the DC grand jury. And I actually believe the fourth will come by way of the state of New York at some point in the future. The reality is we're living in a time when we have individuals who were complicit in the criminal activity of this president going on national news, acting as if they have no idea how this happened. Well, Mr. Barr, if he's a criminal today, according to your estimation of a potential indictment, what was he when you worked for him? All right, Michael, thoughts? Yeah, not, not just when you worked for him. Uh, you heard Attorney General Barr say, uh, former Attorney General, say uh, that the president has a, a penchant uh, for these sorts of things. For, yep. uh, and, and he took a job. Bill Barr said yes when asked to serve that president who had a pre-existing penchant for this kind of behavior, uh, for not being truthful, for embellishing, for skirting the law. All of the things that Barr said, in essence, uh, were known about Donald Trump before Bill Barr said, yeah, you know what, I'll take this job. Jeff Sessions is gone. I'll take this job. Uh, another thing that, that uh, to mention is there are two civil lawsuits, right? There's one about rape and there's one yep. from the Capitol Police officers who were injured. I think three of them together together in a civil lawsuit against the former president from January 6th. So the list is even longer than what we saw right there. But this is really about Bill Barr. We already know everything about Donald Trump. Uh, so to listen to what Bill Barr is saying is, is doubly sickening when you know what he knew, because we all knew what he knew when he signed his name on the, on the sheet that said, uh, yeah, you're going to go work for the president. That's right. And remember, he's the guy who redacted the Mueller investigation created a lie spin and then released a highly redacted form that was intentional that is complicit all right this is what's happening in america governor the damn governor decides to pardon a murderer a killer who killed a Black Lives Matter protester. Put up the picture full mass here. It's a hell of a story. Texas Governor Greg Abbott said he wants to pardon the U.S. Army Sergeant Daniel Perry. All right, Perry is right next to him. After a jury found Perry guilty on Friday of killing a Black Lives Matter protester in Austin, Texas. The actual murder took place in 2020. Keep those pictures up. It was a nationwide protest in the summer of 2020. Many people took to the streets, the voice of their opposition to the state of policing in America after the killing of George Floyd and others. So in this case, this case, Mr. Perry killed Garrett Foster. Mr. Foster was murdered by Mr. Perry. Officers arrested Mr. Perry because they believed he committed murder. A prosecutor prosecuted Mr. Perry because they believed he committed murder. A jury found Mr. Perry guilty because they believed he committed murder. A judge decided not to set aside the, the verdict, which by the way, the judge had the power to do, the reason the judge did not do that is because obviously he believed also the evidence was there for Mr. Perry to be convicted of murder. Literally less than a day later, the governor is already on Twitter talking about how he's going to free this murderer. Keep in mind, he's not looking at evidence. He was not in the court. He has not weighed some um, massive package of information, character testimony, et cetera, the normal things you would typically have to go through in order to get a pardon. And here's the kicker. The governor doesn't even have the authority in Texas to pardon. He has to receive the pardon or the request directly from the pardon and parole board. 
So what does he do? Instead of calling up the friends that he appointed to that board, he decided to go public and tell them, send something to my desk. It's insane. Floyd's death led to the arrest of four officers involved in the incident and sweeping police reforms across the United States. Thousands of people participated in the Black Lives Matter protest across the country in the weeks following the funeral. In Abbott's letter posted on Twitter on Saturday, the Republican governor references the state's stand your ground laws of self-defense. The law allows for deadly force if someone believes themselves <clears throat> to be in danger. On the other hand, the law prohibits someone from claiming self-defense when they themselves incited or provoked violence in any way. Abbott wrote that these laws cannot be nullified by a jury or progressive district attorney. Let's put up the tweet. As soon as this murderer was convicted of killing a Black Lives Matter protester, convicted by a jury of his peers, by the way, the governor decides to do this. I am working as swiftly as Texas law allows regarding the pardon, Sergeant Perry. He says, Texas is one of the strongest stand your ground laws of self-defense that cannot be nullified by a jury or a progressive uh, district attorney. Unlike the president and some other states, the Texas constitution limits the governor's pardon authority to only act on a recommendation by the board of pardons and paroles. Texas law does allow the governor to request the board of pardons and paroles to determine if a person should be granted a pardon. I have made that request and instructed the board to expedite its review. I look forward to approving the board's pardon recommendation as soon as it hits my desk. Additionally, I've already prioritized reining in rogue district attorneys and the Texas legislature is working on laws to achieve that goal. What's happening here in America? Laws have already been passed in the state of Georgia to restrict a district attorney's ability to prosecute local crimes. That has already happened. The catalyst for that, Fonnie Willis, the black woman who is the DA in Fulton County leading the investigation, the criminal investigation against Donald Trump, Giuliani and others. Texas, in Texas, you literally have a prosecutor doing his job, elected by the people, submit the evidence in front of a jury. That jury being the fact finders of the case, weigh the evidence, weigh the circumstances, and they all came to a unanimous decision that this man committed murder. What does Abbott do? Abbott does not review the case. Abbott is not seeking counsel or advice as to the variables involved. He immediately comes out and says, I'm going to pardon him. So here we are. We are letting murderers go who kill people that are allied with Black Lives Matter. And we are firing, expelling state lawmakers in Tennessee who simply stand up and say out loud what needs to be said. That is where we are. There's more. Perry, 33, was indicted in 2021 on charges of murder, aggravated assault, and deadly conduct after he killed the 28-year-old Garrett Foster. That was July 25th, 2020. The Army Sergeant was driving for Uber in downtown Austin when he stopped his vehicle and honked at people protesting police violence while they walked through the street, local law enforcement said at the time. Perry then drove his car into the crowd, according to police, where Foster had been seen openly carrying an AK-47 rifle, which is completely legal in Texas. There are conflicting eyewitness reports, however, regarding which man raised their firearm first, but Perry, who was also legally armed at the time, shot and killed Mr. Foster and then fled the scene. That's called evidence of a guilty conscience. Perry, who later called police and told them he had shot Foster, but had done so in self-defense, now awaits sentencing and could possibly receive life in prison. But no, no, no. 
he's not going to receive life in prison because the governor is okay with the fact that he murdered someone who was advocating for black lives. You gotta understand there's a political context and a racial context. All of this is at play. Meanwhile, political analyst Craig uh, Agrinov told Newsweek on Saturday, and I quote, it is not uncommon for governors to pardon people who have been convicted of crimes, but it is unusual for a governor to pardon someone who has been found guilty of murder. What are they doing? What's really happening? Let me tell you what's happening. Democrats are still playing checkers and the Republicans are playing chess. Checkers, you use your power to gain position. Chess, you use your position to gain power. So the governor has a position. He's using his position in order to level his power. So you may have more progressives in this country than conservatives, very true. Progressives, well over 90% of progressive ideas are actually agreed with by the majority of American voters. But then you have this adversarial political category called conservatives. While they offer no solutions, they offer no remedy, they provide no coalition or support other than their white supremacist ideology and their ridiculous assault on women, they are still an effective opposition when they have no ideas. Why? Why does this continue to happen? Well, many of the Democrats are feckless leaders, and this is partly their fault as well. It is a damn shame we are living in a country where governors will let convicted murderers go on day one. He don't even want the man to stay in jail for a day. And then we have lawmakers exercising the constitutional protected right being told that they can no longer serve the 78,000 people they each represent, who voted them in, who elected them. DAs are under attack. If you are black and you are prosecuting an element of the white establishment, they are coming for you. This is where we are. All right, dear brother, thoughts. Yeah, there, you know this is, and I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, this is a, a triple wedge issue bonanza for somebody like uh, like uh, uh, Abbott. He is speaking clearly to Donald Trump uh, when he's doing this, and he's talking yep. about those three words, uh, progressive district attorney. What has Trump been saying about Alvin Bragg in New York? What has he been saying about Georgia? He's talking about this as a wedge issue, that there are progressive district attorneys that are bringing down this country. What is he doing? He's filling uh, that coffer with his own words about this. And that's an opportunity for somebody like Abbott. The other part of that, which is uh, just as sickening, but just as much of a wedge issue, it says he was carrying an AK-47, openly carrying an AK-47, which is legal in Texas. So it's a gun issue as well for Abbott. He's saying that this was stand your ground, another wedge issue. This is the chess they play that you were talking yep. about. Dr. Ritchie, they take these wedge issues that have nothing to do with making the country better, but have a lot to do with sensationalizing things that are happening. And it's also a way of pointing out, and I think it's important that we realize that it's not just cops beating George Floyd on the streets of Minneapolis that is in play here when it comes to racist uh, and, and, and race motivated law enforcement. It happens in juries, it happens in courtrooms, and it happens in the governor's mansion. So this has this sort of trail of taking us uh, against uh, Black Lives Matter matter, a popular issue among conservatives uh, in favor of guns and stand your ground, a popular issue with racist uh, heritage among conservatives, and then progressive district attorneys. This is exactly uh, what he wants, and this is exactly what in Texas he can very easily get. Very, very well said. We're going to continue to follow the development. Obviously, there will be some. Okay. This is an exclusive, a Georgia high school training coach. This is interesting, has been caught on camera doing this. You and the wolf need to come up here and go hunting. Yeah, and stuff, man. Ain't nothing here, dog. Ain't nothing but blacks up here. All it is, Atlanta, gone down, man, just gone. Look at this pulled out in front of me right here. Bro. Trying to pull out in front of me right here. Look at this trying to pull out in front of me right here. Hey, do you see? Did you see that? 
that tree right there? Yeah. Did you see that tree right there? Roe will hang you from that tree. Got the Glock by the bed. And here we go. Room service. Y'all need y'all to bring me some chicken wings, two hoes, a red bone and a white girl. Y'all want the white girl, uh, Roe gonna try the, the red bone. No, no, Borf ain't coming. Yeah, he was here and everything. He make him leave. He, he make the red bone leave. Yeah, he, no, he don't do that. And everything. So I tried that one time in the house. Yeah, just roll. Yeah. So he, 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 he probably do it, and he probably going to throw out that we on the 14th floor. He probably throw out the window when he done with her. Yeah. Cheap rate. Atlanta. Atlanta. Oh, sir, I'm from Atlanta. Put up the picture full mass. Yeah, you're going to be calling me all kind of N words tonight. The owner of Speed Edge Sports in the state of Georgia, Mark Taylor, is under fire for his racist rant posted on social media about black people living in Atlanta. The Speed Edge sports owner, Mark Taylor of Warner Robins, Georgia, is a speed training trainer coach for high school athletes. Now, let me say this. Um, I'm not sure what you were trying to do. I do know what you did was racist. I don't know if this was a skit that you were sending among your buddies in the Klan, or perhaps you were trying to impress a racist associate. We don't know. Uh, but I do know this. Speed Edge Sports. Uh, let's put it up. All right. I don't want to be unfair to anybody. If there's anyone who would like to patronize this company because of his diligence, and being consistent in whatever he does for a living. You can check out his business on Facebook, uh, Speed Edge Sports. Uh, he says to develop each individual athlete into becoming the best performer in their sport. All right, well, good for you. All the information is there. Uh, as, uh, as of this report, there has been no statement from uh, Mr. Taylor on this matter. The schools who uh, athletes worked with Taylor could not be verified at the moment. Remember, this is hot off the press. We hope that there's a response very soon. I invite Mr. Taylor to come on the program, explain himself anytime. All right, Michael, thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I would love to watch that program where Mr. Speed Edge comes. I don't think you're going to be able to find that Facebook page for much longer. You know, th this is a, an extraordinarily depressing thing because the, the sort of the idealistic way of looking at this is this is a man who works with young athletes of every race and creed, uh, who knows their families, who knows their girlfriends, their boyfriends, who has spent time developing them. And the idea that we can be together, right, in this idealistic place is supposed to change your mind away from that, to realize that everybody is, you know, these are just people. And he's working with them every day. Yep. And he still does this stuff. It's, a, it's shameful, but it's more than anything. It is just depressing. Yeah, it is. And I echo your point about him working with young people and having these uh, these allegations against him, bias, racism, et cetera. And I will say this, based on the Facebook thread, I saw a lot of black people say, uh, say, I have now unfollowed him. Well, what does that mean? That means a lot of black people at one point were following him because they believed he had something, I guess, important to say, or he was good at his job, whatever it may be. He has lost the respect of those that actually did hold him in high honor. I have read the commentary going back and forth. A statement is necessary, obviously, whatever institutions he has worked for or contracted with, they're gonna to have to release a statement this week too. We got more on the other side. It's indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We have a lot of show left. Let me read some of these amazing comments. Before I do that, let me remind you of the Webby Awards, all right? Big deal stuff. TYT has been nominated for another Webby Award, this time in the viral video category for 
Anna's passionate rant on abortion rights. It was a remarkable, remarkable passionate rant. Head to tyt.com forward slash vote. Cash your vote today. Vote closes April 20th, all right? We appreciate you in advance. All right, let me go to some of the comments. Mickey C, the silver hair dragon, Trump has publicly admitted that after he swore he returned all the documents, that he not only still had some, but that he went through the boxes looking for specific ones. He admitted it on there. There's no denying it. That proves his obstruction. Bingo, you're absolutely correct. All right, Cuban cowboy. Uh, thank you for reminding me to update my voters registration, Dr. Richie. <laughs> Gotta get Abbott out of office. I mean, damn, Abbott is out of control, all right? Okay, uh, Cena Hogaboom, hyper willful ignorance on display, thick and heavy hatred, talking about the uh, coach. And YouTube. Tony 45 FU2. That's right. Remember for one month, we appreciate your support. Shout out from the, I think, STL for great informative show, Grand Riser. Grand Riser. Uh, Meredith Putvin, Ralina Dragon. Remember for three months. Thank you for your support. And yet, Abbott is willing to set aside the stand your ground law for a murderous instigator. So, where this is, see where this is going? Question mark. That's right. Uh, the law does not apply when you incite the violence. He has decided to become not only a defense attorney, but a bad one at that, not citing the proper statute. C. Michael Henson, thank you, C. Michael. Abbott, DeSantis, the Tennessee legislature, and others are now boldly telling the world that black lives don't matter to them. and They are desperate to keep opposition silent. Boom, there it is. That's exactly what they're doing. All right, got something for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you Karen Wood. You want to call the police on him for having a barbecue on a and Sunday? You're going to feel free! Back off! I'm going to tell an African-American man to threaten my life. If you f- for robbery and stealing, so she needs to get the f*** out of here before I get her put in jail for the rest of her life. Sir, you are on camera right now. You see, that's a coward, all right? Uh, You get no points for going to a fast food restaurant, slapping the cashier who's trying to be decent to you. Uh, This is actually somewhat of a throwback, Karen. We have more information now. Let's put up the picture full mask. According to TMZ, 21-year-old Austin Addison was charged with harassment disorderly conduct and criminal mischief. Records show he was released on a signature bond, meaning no money put up. This is out of Butler County, Pennsylvania. And according to the report, he was hyper angry looking for a female employee that he apparently knew. Uh, I don't want want to say this to the cashier. Uh, To me, sir, you are a, a real hero. Um, You had a very aggressive guy who was obviously willing to be violent. You did not back away. You were trying to be a responsible person. And I think you absolutely were. Uh, We appreciate your presence. We appreciate how you stood up, all right? Uh, And don't allow the cowards of the world like him to bother your day. Michael, thoughts? Well, I mean, you said it all. It, what, what's really great about this is going back and learning how what the disposition of these cases were, yeah. because we see them in a moment, we see them in a window, and then they go away, and the next one comes out. And so it's it's uh, actually, you know, I haven't been on the show in a little bit, Dr. Ritchie, but to go back and see what happened to these people uh, brings uh, at least a little bit of, of pleasure to know that they had to answer for this and uh, whatever his excuses were, uh, right. they were not acceptable. So, uh, you know, uh, did we ever come up with a name for a male Karen? Is it, male uh, Karen. Yeah, male Karen. Male okay. Karen. Good name, MK. Yeah. There you go. All right, very sad story, horrific, unbelievable. Put his picture up for a mask. You see, this five-year-old child is dead. He's dead because teachers ignored the fact 
that he collapsed, thought he was playing. Romeo Pierre Luis is a five-year-old child who died in his kindergarten recess class on April 5th of last year. A lawsuit has now been filed, and we have more details about this tragedy. The incident occurred at Charter Oak International. This is in Hartford, Connecticut. Romeo was lying on the ground for nearly 10 minutes without receiving medical attention at all, despite several teachers being within eyesight, says the lawsuit filed last week, according to the Hartford Current. Several of the Tykes classmates told teachers about Romeo's collapse, but the educators assumed he was playing a game. Children called, play dead, the suit claims. 35 minutes after collapsing, the young boy was being transported to the Connecticut Children's Hospital. He would later die on April 7, 2022, due to heart complications. That's according to WFSB. School security footage captured the collapse. It also showed one teacher arriving at his side and checking his pulse before noticing he was no longer breathing. Now remember, this happened after students told teachers he needs help. They did not help him. After reviewing the security footage, officer said the facts provided by all the children did not differ in any material way. All of the children stated that Romeo was running around playing freeze tag and then fell and stopped breathing. According to the report, none of the children mentioned anything about seeing him bump his head, ingest anything, or say anything, which could lead to a possible indicator as to why he collapsed. There were no signs of trauma, failing, or anything else, falling, excuse me, or anything else, which would indicate what caused his eventual collapse. Now, they're trying to spin a narrative to provide cover. I'm going to show you why. The family, let's put it up family who say if the town's policies and procedures were actually followed, Romeo would be alive today, and they are so right. They held a vigil at the Charter Oak Academy. During the vigil, the family showed a video where Romeo recited Bible scriptures and the Lord's Prayer before capturing him being a kid, jumping and doing flips all over his house. In addition to his family, the school community was also deeply affected by Romeo's death, according to interim superintendent Andrew Morrow. So let me give you the um, principal and superintendent, okay? Buck stops with them, they are your leaders. So we have the superintendent Morrow alongside the principal, Georgina Rivera. The death of a child is a devastating and unimaginable loss. Now, our thoughts and prayers are with the family and friends of Romeo. Morrow said in a statement, this tragedy has deeply affected the Charter Oak International Academy community and the school district continues to make grief support and emotional assistance available to any student or educator who needs it. What about the damn teachers that let them die? You got any words for them? What about the family you let down? What about the child you did not protect? What about the failures inside of the institution? A baby is dead and you are offering thoughts and prayers. I would be mad as hell. I would be mad as hell. First at myself. Now, granted, the police are already spinning narrative to give cover, saying, well, you know, there was no other thing that happened. So why would the teachers know? You know, because there's a child lifeless on the ground for that long. And other students are saying, this is not a game. We are not playing. He is not breathing. Any teacher who ignores that is unfit to teach, to watch our children, period. Even if there was no malicious intent, this is called gross negligence. These are children, these are children. 
you are paid as professionals. Now, here, here's what won't happen. You won't see legislation being passed in order to address this, even though a child is dead. You won't see a lawmaker presenting a bill in order to hold teachers accountable to a higher standard of care. No, they're concerned about critical race theory, not even talk. They want you to run after red meat that solves nothing. This is where a lawmaker actually is effective, right here, to correct a wrong, to remedy a matter that caused the death of a human being. This is when we need more oversight, accountability, policy, and protocol. You need a lawmaker in this situation. All right, Michael, thoughts here. Well, I mean, thoughts first, uh, you know, on what you were just saying, I, I, I can't pretend to know what the remedy for this would be. This is unbelievably sad even before it's outrageous, but it is also outrageous. And, you know, the, the biggest part of this for me is 10 minutes, right? If a, if a kid is on the ground for 48 seconds and you do nothing, that's one yeah. thing. Because in fact, they could be playing this game uh, that they play. But after 10 minutes, we all know kids can't do things for much more than a minute and a half anyway without That's moving right. on to the next thing. And you're not going to have a kid doing the play dead game without getting attention uh, for that long a period of time. So it's, it's unbelievable to me that these teachers could have been both informed about it and sensitive to, to, to how children are, presumably because of their position, uh, that they would just allow this to go on. So yes, this is, as you said, gross negligence. Now, Connecticut is a state that has fought back hard and not acknowledging a critical race theory. I don't think it's an either or in this case, uh, but it shouldn't just stop at what I think will probably happen, which is no more of this play dead game in a classroom. Those are the quick and easy remedies. They're the lazy remedies. Uh, there has to be some accountability for teachers in this in, in this kind of a case yeah. i don't know retroactively out of a tragedy we can't bring obviously poor romeo back but at least something can be done here uh, a romeo's law for example which uh, does little to 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 the people who love him but can at least save lives going forward that's or right. at least save health going forward that seems necessary that's right it just seems so common sense yeah. you see a child play dead for a minute or two minutes Wait a minute now. I mean, children don't typically uh, no. have that kind of patience. No. Uh, and for you to have warnings from other students and do nothing is unbelievable. We got more on the other side. It's indisputable. Stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We have a lot of show left, a lot of comments, and a reminder. Make sure to check out Nina Turner, unbossed. Learn how you can take control of democracy from the corrupt forces in government and media. Find full clips of Unbossed by scanning the QR code or going to youtube.com forward slash Unbossed TYT. Remarkable content. We got a lot of comments. I will read as many as I can. Kind of press for time, all right? Worst case scenario, Dragon. Why are they always yelling a low, at low wage restaurant workers? Um, Devil Dog Dragon, no, no cost arrest, no charge. Had that been a black or Hispanic that slapped uh, that man, they would have, uh, they would be under the jail, under a grave marker. Uh, Nola Lady, thank you. Welcome to Indisputable. We appreciate your support. C. Michael Henson, thank you, C. Michael. Dr. Richard, that Burger King cashier is much better than me. Ain't no way. I'm a pretty patient guy, but I probably would have lost my job that day. No, you wouldn't. That's called self-defense, dear brother. All right? Okay. And Twitch. Gomez, 2420. They want to arm teachers, but they can't even check the kids when they are doing normal things. Good point. All right. California teacher decides to say the N-word 15 times. Back to back to back to back. Here it is. Let's put the picture up for a mass here. Okay. There's a reason why teachers are professionals um, to ensure they do not engage in conduct like that.
that was a California language arts teacher at Sequoia Middle School caught on video repeatedly using the N word and then forcing a student to use the racial slur as well because it's, and I quote, in the dictionary. The teacher who has not yet been identified was discussing Mark Twain's adventures of Tom Sawyer with her class. And one of the 2,219, excuse me, utterances of the racial slur came up in their discussion. According to the students, a student who refused to repeat after the teacher reportedly asked the teacher the correct spelling of the word. The teacher got in front of the class and she was saying that the word is just an English word and everybody can say it if, uh, and everybody can say it if she wants to. It's in the dictionary, she says. And people are oversensitive over the word. A black student who shot the video told the outlet, she was trying to force him to say the word and she repeatedly kept saying it and she had a smirk on her face I was just thinking, dang, this teacher's out of her mind, added the student who asked to remain anonymous. That student is a, is a world leader. Uh, in the viral clip, the teacher seen hovering over the uncomfortable student as he hunches over table. You ask me how to spell it, so go ahead and pronounce it. Goes on to say N-word. Pronounce it after me, she says N-word twice more. She says that she says it with a slight smirk as the class giggles. He was getting uncomfortable. He was shaking his head and started to put his head down. The student who captured the exchange told KTLA. The teacher uttered the slur about 15 times according to the child. Bianca Gibbons, a parent who shared the alarming footage on Facebook wrote, this took place at my daughter's school in Fontana at Sequoia Middle School. Please stop racism and verbal violence bullying. She added, this teacher should be fired. All right, so here's the um, district statement to the media. It has been made aware of a video circulating on social media depicting a recent incident at Sequoia Middle School. During this incident, an exchange occurred between students and a teacher regarding a derogatory term encountered during a lesson related to a Mark Twain novel. While we acknowledge that this derogatory language comes from a novel first published in the late 1800s, and that historical context is important to consider when discussing literature, the district does not condone the language that was used in the video or using that language outside of the context of discussing the novel. The statement added. The district said it is currently investigating this situation, adding that while we cannot provide additional detail at this time, please be assured that the district takes this and all reports of demeaning language seriously, addresses the matter promptly, and takes any necessary action. KTLA reported that the teacher has been allowed, uh, has been allowed back into the classroom, and reportedly she said she didn't care about what the students or their parents think. She told ABC7, that she did not wish to comment. Oh, okay. Um, not only are you unprofessional, madam, in my estimation, uh, you're hard-headed. Uh, you have no business teaching lessons when you can't learn them. You offended the very core of many of your students, parents, community, and community leaders. If you can't learn a lesson from your own experience, then madam, you know that what they say, a hard head, make a soft ass. Now, I'm hoping that at some point you do release a statement and you say, hey, I've seen the light. I know what happened. I know where I was wrong. I know where the lion got out of the cage. It won't happen again. I'm gonna take this training. I'm going to leave this school and hopefully regain my career somewhere else. But if the school system is allowing you to come back with that attitude, no remorse, no apology, no statement, no nothing, then they too are complicit in the lack of advocacy for our children. All right, Michael, thoughts here. 
Uh, unquestionably. I mean, it, this is, uh, it's outrageous. The, the thing she says at the end, look, we'd be criticizing her if she apologized and she said, I was wrong to do this. We would still be critical of what she did do. Uh, right. We'd be critical of what the, the, the place did. But she did the exact opposite. She said, I don't care what these students think, that what these students think. I don't care what their families think. I mean, that alone is grounds. Forgetting this ever happened. If you're a teacher who doesn't care what their students or their families think, you shouldn't be in a classroom to begin with. And uh, this is a, a chance for me to uh, shout out Emily Park, wherever she may be. She was my sixth grade English teacher. There you go. And that's when I learned Tom Sawyer. And that's when we had that uncomfortable conversation about the language that was in that. And she explained to me and, and to our class that it was of a time. It's important we know how they spoke and how we don't anymore. Just the same way when we read Shakespeare, they don't speak like that anymore. And, and, and Emily Park taught me a lesson, taught all of us a lesson that day, that you can read this stuff, you can see a glimpse into literature and American history and not have to say those words, repeat those words. But in fact, it's a way to teach that you don't use those words. And that yep. was lost in Fontana, California. This woman should not have a job in the classroom. Yeah, well said. All right, a black secret service agent gets detained by the police twice, now wins a huge $730,000 lawsuit. Let's put up these pictures. This is going to be an interesting story that highlights the reality of racism in America, especially among law enforcement members. A retired black, let's put the pictures up. A retired black secret service agent sued the US Park Service after, after he was twice detained while on duty, all right? He was on duty nearly nine years ago. Now the former special agent, um, has a bunch of money. It was awarded $730,000. Hicks was detained twice on July 11, 2015 by officers Brian Phillip and Gerald Ferreira for more than an hour. The former agent was first detained by Ferreira as he sat in his vehicle before Don on the shoulder of Baltimore Washington Parkway waiting to lead a motorcade to protect the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Now you got to think about the irony of this. You, your secret, your secret service. You have law enforcement credentials, badge, gun, top secret clearance. You're working on the detail for Homeland Security, and somebody, literally a cop, says, "Hey, you got to go uh, get detained." Let's put up the lawsuit documents, okay? Ferreira saw Hicks on the shoulder of the highway, seated in his unmarked vehicle and claimed he just wanted to perform a welfare check. The officer claimed he noticed Hicks' gun in his holster on the passenger seat and drew his weapon, yelling, don't touch the gun. Hicks, who has said he heard a tap on his passenger window and looked up to see a gun pointed at him, unrolled his window while following the directions of the officer and immediately identified himself as U.S. Secret Service. Hicks also showed him his identification. The officer took Hicks' gun. Hicks maintained that Ferreira continued yelling and telling him to shut the up. Yeah, yeah, I believe that, all right? So this officer saw another officer that outranked him, that had more clout than him, that had more prestige in the hierarchy of law enforcement tradition. So he doesn't care that this man is Secret Service. He's about to put somebody in their place, all right? Ferreira continued, according to the report, to appear very agitated to the point of spitting at the mouth while he was shaking profusely with the handgun pointed in Hicks' direction. At this point, the officer removed Hicks' weapon from the car and returned to his patrol vehicle, read the lawsuit. I felt completely helpless that here I was, an African-American male that was surrounded by all Caucasian officers, Ferreira is Hispanic, 
added Hicks at the civil trial. I just felt very disgusted at the same time and just very upset and scared. Even though Ferreira could easily verify Hicks' identity and there was no crime committed, he detained him until a park police officer could come from Anacostia. Officer Phillips arrived on the scene as Hicks waited and began to question him as to why he had his weapon on the seat and asked if he'd been asleep. Hicks was on the phone with the supervisor explaining the dumbass situation he was in. As Hicks was detained, the motorcade left without him and passed by where he was being detained around 6.40 a.m. Phillips reportedly, mockingly waved his hand goodbye at the motorcade as it passed. Once the park police sergeant Wallace arrived and talked to Hicks' supervisor on the phone, Hicks was released. Within minutes, Hicks was pulled over again by Phillips, who asked for Hicks' license and registration. Hicks was still on the phone with his supervisor so he could meet up with the motorcade and do his job. Phillips let Hicks go without writing a citation. He just wanted to put him in his place again. There's more. Uh, this reportedly was not the first run-in Hicks had with one of the officers. So Hicks uh, and Ferreira had met previously. In 2009, Hicks had helped detain the officer before his arrest outside of a bar in Washington. The Washington Post reports. Hicks had been flagged down by a bystander at the scene of a fistfight between Officer Ferreira and a cab driver, where he was the first law enforcement officer on the scene to intervene. Herrera later saw his charges stemming from the fight dropped. The Washington Post noted that evidence of a turf war between local law enforcement agencies was not allowed in the proceedings. Hicks testified that Phillips asked him, why are you in our district? This is the Park Police District. During the first stop, it told him he was getting mouthy at the second stop. Phillips claimed during the civil proceedings that he didn't he didn't recognize uh, Hicks vehicle when he pulled him over the second time. Uh, Ferreira just uh, justified his actions by noting that no shots were fired during Hicks detainment. The jury sided with Hicks found, <clears throat> excuse me, Officer Ferreira and Phillips liable for violating the constitutional rights of a Secret Service agent. Uh, let's put them up. Ned Parent, both officers, appellate attorney called the Fourth Circuit court decision irreconcilable. We are considering all available options to continue this fight on behalf of the officers, Ferrer and Phillips, including a request uh, for an in-bank review of the Fourth Circuit and a petition for writ uh, 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 cert of the U.S. Supreme Court. That's a review of the case and the facts. Hicks was awarded $250,000 for uh, compensatory damages and then another $525,000 for punitive uh, for emotional distress. Punitive is to punish uh, the law enforcement agency for their, their egregious activity. So here we are. Uh, you have a black male doing his job and he gets caught up in a good old boy network. They engage in extreme action. Now, while he got a bunch of money, guess what did not happen? You know, the actions of these officers are actually illegal. It is illegal to detain someone without justification. That's against the law. It is illegal to manipulate a police report to fit your narrative. That's against the law. It is illegal to utilize your authority in order to harm another citizen to settle a personal score. That is against the law. Violation of oath of office is a felony. Are they charged with crimes? Are their supervisors upset at them for what they did to this man? These cops are actually defunding the police. Our conservatives outraged that they are now 700 plus thousand dollars lighter in the pocket in that jurisdiction. No, you know why? Because they'll spend a million dollars if a cop tries to put a black man in his place. No problem. Spend as much money as you want to. All right, Michael, thoughts. 
I like what you did there with the defunding of the police there by costing them over 700 k That was uh, that was well played, Dr. Ritchie. I, I, I think when when you for, first of all, a couple of things come to mind. Um, one is also that this the irony of it being the Homeland Security chief doesn't even get his security because these two racist cops are, are taking their uh, their uh, Secret Service agent aside. I mean, it, you couldn't even write that if you wrote it. No one would believe it. They would change it right. to a a different protectee. Uh, the other part of it is, you know, they use the words mouthy. I mean, you hear the words mouthy, you, it reminds you of when you heard decorum being used in the Tennessee Assembly last week. Uh, these are code words, uh, mouthy and decorum, uh, yep. to people who want to use them as such. And and I think we've said enough there by, by just pointing that out. Uh, and then finally, the, the thing that struck me was, uh, hey, no shots were fired which is like a victory in some way from the police, right? Hey, we didn't shoot anybody like we ordinarily might, uh, but this time we didn't and we should be rewarded for that. No, shots shouldn't have been fired because the person should not have been detained in the first place. So, I mean, th of course shots weren't fired. That's not, that's not something you need a slap on the back for. You. That's something that you shouldn't even mention. Anyway, I, I think uh, it, it what's, what's good is that this uh, was punished, uh, at least civilly and at least with, uh, you know, punitively, uh, but more needs to be done, obviously. And it seems like it was, uh, as you said, I don't know the legality of it, but it seems like it goes to a level, rises to a level where there should be criminal charges against these men, uh, especially if it's in clear violation of, of what the law there is. And I, 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 I would applaud that. Yeah, same here. All right. We got more on the other side. It's indisputable stick and stay. All right, welcome back. An amazing story. A grandmother saves her granddaughter. Let's put up that picture for a mask. This is one of those uh, stories that reminds you of the great love, passion, and fortitude of a grandmother. 52-year-old Jacqueline Roberts broke her two ankles in a heroic effort to save her five-year-old granddaughter trapped in a blazing apartment fire in Hampton, Georgia. According to 11 Alive News, the incident took place a little after 4 p.m., an apartment along Nicole Drive on March 27th. Roberts was awakened by family members who alerted her of the fire. She explained that her daughter grabbed her grandson, a granddaughter, then proceeded to walk down the 17 flights of stairs. But then her granddaughter, Autumn, ran back up the stairs, Roberts said. Roberts had decided to return upstairs to retrieve important documents like her identification card, she said. She was able to find her granddaughter through the smoke. If I had gone downstairs with my daughter. My granddaughter would have been in the fire. She would have perished. Roberts explained as tears came down her face. I saw her silhouette in my son's doorway, she recalled. She said, Grandma, get me. Grandma, get me. Grandma, don't leave me. Save me. Roberts then explained that the only way out was through a second story window that was about 15 feet off the ground. At this time, the smoke is coming now, she said. It's getting a little more dangerous. She's coughing. I'm coughing. I kind of bent over on my window to where the front of my stomach and my pelvic bone were over uh, the windowsill, she said. When I dropped her, she said, ouch. And then it said, I'm okay, Grandma. And I said, okay, you have to move now. Grandma can jump. Robert said she was thankful the rain made the grass muddy and soft for her to land. The 52-year-old woman was rushed to Grady Memorial Hospital because she reportedly suffered two broken ankles and a few bruises. Her granddaughter only had a few scratches. Robert said that fire officials and her landlord told her that the cause of the fire was electrical. It was reported that they lost everything. Uh, the family has now started a GoFundMe. I would like us to support them in any way we can. Jacqueline's ankles, uh, ankles and medical bills. All right, we want to make sure we help support them during this tragedy. But thankfully, no fatality. Everybody survived. All of the items are 
able to be replaced uh, to the grandmother. Thank you. Thank you for being a real hero. Thank you for standing up, doing what you needed to do to save your granddaughter. Um, to the family, I hope that this segment, this broadcast will bring um, some level of peace, possibly a few material items to comfort you as you transition to your new place to live. Um, I'm so glad that you all are alive, right? Okay, tell them a story. We got more on the other side. The bullpen is next, stick and stay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. This is Wesley Phelps. He's 28 years old. He was on drugs. He had priors for burglary and assault in a minor. He led police on a high-speed chase, crashed his car, and his girlfriend died. And Judge Sybil Reynolds gave him three years. But on the same day that Judge Sybil Reynolds gave him three years, he gave Lakeith Smith 65 years. Lakeith is 15 years old. Him and some other kids were breaking into an unoccupied dwelling. The cops showed up, the kids ran. The cops shot Adante Washington, which is Lakeith Smith's best friend, shot Adante in the back three times. Due to Alabama's felony murder law, Lakeith Smith was sentenced to 65 years for the murder of Adante, even though he didn't hold the weapon or shoot anybody. This happened on the same day in the same court by the same judge. 28 year old who's actually responsible for somebody dying, 15 year old who's actually not responsible for anybody dying. We covered this story, such a shame. Uh, we wanna thank Charlie for contacting the show, alerting us to this miscarriage of justice. On the program today, we have um, Lakeith Smith's mother, Lakeith Smith's mother. Her name is Brontina Smith. She goes by Tina. Thank you, Madam, for being on the program. Welcome. And also the attorney, Leroy Maxwell Jr. Uh, his practice focuses on appellate litigation, civil rights, and criminal defense. He has recovered millions and millions in injury cases and is a noted attorney at law. Thank you both for being on the show. Wish it was under better circumstances. What I would like to do is first express uh, my heart and care uh, to you, uh, Ms. Smith, because naturally I cannot imagine what you're going through. Uh, but if you would give us some insight as to what's happening now in this situation, in this case. Um, <clears throat> well, a little bit. We had a court here, a court hearing for a resentencing on March 21st. Okay. We were so under the oppression that my son was coming home. Mm -hmm. um, we were we were confident, more than confident, actually. Uh, well, that, that was a blowback. Uh, my son's sentence was reduced to 30 years instead of 25, which is still a slap in the face. Uh, so now we're going into um, the appellate stage, and you know we're going to keep fighting. To get my son home, you know, and, um, take the justice. Yeah, Mr. Maxwell, let's talk about this from the legal side. Uh, we heard Ms. Smith just say uh, she just, you know, th there was a strong indication he could come home. Uh, obviously, the judge could have done this. Tell us the background to this case legally. Yeah, thank you so much for having us on. Um, like Tina said, he should have come home. Uh, with this case, he was sentenced uh, back eight years ago when. Uh, the time of the crime, uh, Lakeith Smith was only 15 years old. He went to trial for felony murder, and we'll talk about that felony murder rule, which is just a tremendous um, uh, disservice to our community, uh, to folks in general, that sort of law uh, that basically sentences people who don't have intent uh, and sends them to the harsh crimes as if they did have intent to commit something uh, heinous. And so he was ultimately sentenced to 65 years. Uh, we jumped in on his case. We filed pleadings showing that his sentence was unconstitutional. His trial counsel was awful uh, and woefully insufficient. Judge agreed with us on most of those counts and allowed us to have resentencing. We went in there, uh, argued resentencing based on the fact of his age, 
other mitigating circumstances uh, and how woefully insufficient his legal counsel was. Uh, the judge in this case came back with a reduction and sentence down to 30 years, uh, but we still believe that's a complete miscarriage of justice. Uh, Lakeith should be home. He didn't kill anyone. He didn't intend to kill anyone. It was a bad police shooting where the officer killed this young man, his best friend, uh, kill shot in the back of the base of the neck, um, and they needed someone to take the blame. So they put their target towards Lakeith. Uh, he went to trial uh, because he did not want to admit to killing his friend, which he did not do. Uh, and now uh, he was faced uh, with 65 years. We got it reduced down, but he still needs to be home. Let's talk about the dysfunction of the justice system, because I'm sure there was an opportunity for him to plead guilty to something at a lesser uh, penalty. Uh, he refused. Let's talk about how this got to a 65 year sentence of a 15 year old. I, I, you know, I don't know the law like you do, so I'm still in law school myself, but we've studied cases where we've considered that unconstitutional for a long time uh, to sentence a 15 year old to such, uh, to such time. Right, I, I agree. And uh, I was there arguing uh, with Brian Stevenson, the landmark case and uh, Miller v. Jackson and um, yep. uh, where we argued that young folks should not be sentenced to these sort of harsh sentences, uh, ultimately to die in prison. Uh, and so what this judge did here, um, what Sibley Reynolds did, he basically found a way around that by not giving them a life sentence, but he gave them a 65 year sentence, one that uh, the life expectancy of a black man, that's a death sentence. Uh, he sentenced him with the intent to make sure that he never comes out of that prison again. Uh, and so it's cruel. Unfortunately, uh, it's not unusual. And uh, you know uh, in law school that uh, both components have to be met, the cruel right. and unusual. Yep. It's absolutely cruel, but in Alabama and states like ours, it's not unusual. So we have a hard time meeting that Eighth Amendment burden. Wow. Wow. Before I go back to the mother, uh, Attorney Maxwell, let me ask you one more question. Uh, at this point, is there anything that can hold the judge accountable for the obvious um, difference between the sentencing of the white male and then the sentencing of the black male juvenile? Well, uh, typically we know that this has gone on for for centuries, for, for decade after decade, where there's been, been this complete uh, disproportionate uh, type of sentencing uh, depending on skin color. Uh, and we've taken certain steps and legislate, legislation and other things to try to correct that. Uh, but we know that we can't correct the human side of it. We have a judge here who is inflicting that sort of white supremacist uh, identity uh, onto this case. As far as what it is that we could do, uh, this judge sentenced him and basically got out and retired. Uh, he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, he still might oversee a few other cases and we want to make it known and I know that us and other organizations, uh, we're reviewing his cases right now. Uh, we saw what happened here and we think there's a pattern. And if there is a pattern, there's probably a lot of our sons locked up and incarcerated for uh, uh, erroneous uh, um, miscarriage uh, style sentences uh, that should be home right now. And so right. we want to hold them accountable and we want to make sure those who have been affected uh, receive some sort of uh, benefit. Something that happened when he was 15 years of age, he did not commit the criminal offense. This is one of those weird laws that basically attributes blame without a person forming mans rea or the intent to commit that particular crime. It's truly a tragedy. Um, Ms. Smith, let me ask you this question. Your son has been dealing with this ordeal since he was 15. Obviously, you're a parent. I'm a parent. You've been dealing with it as well. Yes, what? is the 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 sense from your son right now is he hopeful uh, that at some point this justice system will wake up and judge itself well um my son he is he's very hopeful because he know that, that we're out here and we're fighting um he's more hopeful toward us in the system itself yeah you know we were he knows that if we are dependent on the system uh, you know we'll probably get no help so mm -hmm. thank God for the team that we have, you know, that's helping us to um, open eyes, you know, to the Alabama system 
you know, he, he knows that we're trying our best and we're going to get him home. Let me ask you this. When all of this first happened um, and there's a trial, there's this prosecution, what was going through your mind, Ms. Smith? Did you believe that the system would at least uh, not go this extreme with your son? Originally, it was six to five years. What were your thoughts during the time of trial? Well, um, yeah, I, initially, I didn't think that um, the judge at first, you know, uh, um, take a 15 year old and just and, and just give his life away. Just take, take sure. his life. Away. Right. I didn't, and I and I thought at first that the attorney that we had, um, that we hired, I thought that she was also on our team. She was going to fight, you know, for us to, you know, and, and 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 let's be clear, to get some time, maybe the time for the burglary, okay. you know, absolutely not the time for the death of a Dante Washington. Right. And right. so it, it 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 came to be clear. You know that the system was definitely not on our side. After maybe like um, the first, the second half of day one in the courtroom, um, everything became so clear mm. that we were going to have, you know, that things was, was going to go not in our favor. Let me do this. I want to put up the GoFundMe graphic. I want to put that up full screen. Um, Ms. Smith, I want you to tell us about the key. What kind of young man is he? Uh, Witty, um, smart, real smart. Um, when I had him on the when I had him out here with me on the street, as we say, um, fun, funny, fun to be around. Um, family oriented, you know, spoiled, just a typical, you know, American black boy, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, oh man, prankster. I love football. You know, just you know. What you do at 15, you know, you get up and go hang out with your friends, come home and, and tear the refrigerator down, you know. Mm -hmm. Just a, those, a typical way. Those years, his childhood has been uh, disrupted in a way that he can never really get back. Taken away. Uh, yeah, completely taken away. Here's what I want viewers to do. Uh, we're going to put that GoFundMe up again. I want you to give, I want you to give your very best because this is going to be a marathon for him and his family. Uh, but I believe as the mother, I believe as attorney Maxwell Jr., I believe that the young Lakeith Smith is going to be victorious eventually. I believe that our justice system will be proven to be not only wrong, but immoral in their prosecution and sentencing of this child. And I believe that Mr. Lakeith Smith will be one of our generational leaders in this nation. You can be part of the process of his justice. Because when he gets justice, we get justice. Great. Absolutely. All right. Attorney, what's yes, next? Sir. What can we do? Uh, just like you said, uh, share, go out and donate, support uh, Ms. Tina Smith, uh, the coalition, and all that we're doing because we're just not bringing attention to Lakeith's case. We're bringing attention to this rogue felony murder rule. Uh, we have too many folks that I'm sitting in front of, mothers, fathers, explaining to me that their child didn't pull a trigger, didn't do anything, uh, yet they're facing a life sentence for uh, this crime called felony murder. And so we want to bring awareness to it. I think if people knew just how atrocious it was and how rogue it's become, uh, uh, they, they would be shocked. Uh, and so we want to bring attention to that and force our legislators and other folks uh, to do the right thing, not just for Lakeith, but for everyone out there who's suffering because of this law. Very well said. Um, to you both, um, to Ms. Uh, Tina Smith, I appreciate your strength and courage. Um, to Attorney Maxwell, thank you for your advocacy and your expert legal prowess. We appreciate Absolutely. your continued and collective leadership. All right, we're going to continue to follow this. Naturally, if you need anything, make sure you reach out, okay? Thank, right. you. thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Welcome to Indisputable. 
I'm your host, Dr. Rashad Richard. We got a lot happening today. But what do we do on this show? We tell the truth. You know why we tell the truth? Because the truth is simply indisputable. Rashad, great to be here. Congratulations on the new show. And I got to let everybody know that Rashad and I go way back. People still need health care, so I won't stop. People still need criminal justice systems reform throughout this country, so I won't stop. And you won't stop either.